Well, good morning, Kingsway. All right, that sounds pretty sharp. I won't tell the nine o'clock that you were better than them, but uh, I want to welcome everybody that's joining us online too. So glad that you can be with us. Come on, Cherry Hill, let's say hello to everybody that's online with us today. Yeah. Awesome, terrific looking bunch in the room, and uh, man, we're thrilled to start a brand new series today, but before we get into that, a uh, couple of preliminary things here. First, let me just say happy Independence Day weekend to you. It's always a little tricky because I know it's middle of the week, but I uh, hope you get to enjoy and celebrate that with family and friends, and you know, I was just thinking about it this morning. Um, what, what a privilege, what an honor, and I think it comes with a responsibility as well, the freedom that we have in our country, uh, though far from perfect, uh, we have the freedoms, a lot of freedoms. And one of them that's really important is the freedom to do exactly what it is we're doing now, the freedom to gather and worship together uh, our God. So very grateful for that as we think about that going into the next couple of days as we celebrate uh, the birthday of our nation, Independence Day, and uh, just excited that you're in the room with us today. We're going to get into a series I mentioned a moment ago that's called The Fruit and the Vine. And on the way in today, you were handed a little booklet with plenty of blank pages and also an overview of how the series is going to go. We tend to, in the summer, take some extended time because the summer affords us to really pick one series and like lock ourselves into that, dig a little bit deeper, swim in the deep end of the pool, if you will. So that's what we're going to attempt to do uh, over the next 10 weeks. You were also handed on the way in some elements for communion, the cracker and the juice. We're going to celebrate communion together. And for those of you that aren't in the room here with us, but online, I'll let you know so that you can go grab some bread or some crackers or some juice, whatever you might have there at home to uh, be part of that celebration at the end of service. We're going to have communion together. But uh, I would encourage you to bring this back each week. Um, If you're a note taker, you're my kind of people. And if you're not a note taker, maybe you can become one during this series. There's going to be some stuff worth noting and writing down. And we just hope that that guide helps you over the next couple of months. Uh, we, we, We get excited about the opportunity to explore something a little bit more closely. If you were with us two summers ago, uh, we spent an entire summer through the book of Proverbs in a series called Wise Guys. Last year, we talked uh, through the book. We preached through the book of Philippians in, uh, in the New Testament. Paul's letter there to the church of Philippi and on choosing joy was the theme. And so this year on the fruit and the vine, and we're going to talk about it today in a little bit of a different order, and we'll get there in just a moment. If you have your Bibles and you want to meet me somewhere, you can meet me in the Gospel of John, John 15. Let me do a little bit of setting the backdrop and creating a little bit of foundation for us to launch off of, and then we'll get to John, and we'll look at a verse in Galatians prior to that as well. But uh, I, I don't know if you are like me. I, I appreciate the seasons, right, that we get a little bit of different weather, different times, right, or we're supposed to at least in the Northeast here in Jersey. But my favorite by far is the summer. Any summer fans in the house? Yeah. I mean, some people came in today doing this, and I walked out there for just a moment to take a peek at the Kona ice truck, and the humidity then, as of where it was at like 8 o'clock when I got in the building, was totally different, so I know you came in sweating. We're going to do our best to cool you off afterwards with some water ice, so uh, hopefully you'll enjoy that, but uh, I, I don't mind the humidity. I'll take humidity and heat over snow any day. Uh, I like the summer for a bunch of reasons. We're in the middle of baseball season. The All-Star Game's coming up. Uh, we got youth camps going on that our kids are going to. Too. That's always good. How many parents are excited to send their kid to camp? Yeah, I talked to a parent last week. Their kid got done school on Friday. They were in camp on Monday morning. There's like, there's no break. Don't tell them there's a break. They're just going to keep going through. So the summer creates all these different rhythms and um, patterns for us. Some of them are appreciated and look forward to. Others, maybe not so much. But it's the same thing here at Kingsway Church. If you've been around for a while, and if you're new, certainly a welcome to you. But if you've been around Kingsway for a while in the summer, we have a lot going on too. You heard Dave mentioned a moment ago, Serve Week is uh, right around the corner from the 8th to the 15th, and we're excited to be able to just be uh, practically serve people in Jesus' name out of both of our campuses in Glassboro and Cherry Hill and a bunch of places in between, so uh, I encourage you to be part of that. If you haven't already looked at that menu and signed up, you should do that. Uh, But we also have kids going to youth camps and kids camps. We have teams that will leave in about a month or so, early August, for both El Salvador, our Kingdom Builders missions trip to El Salvador. We simultaneously have a team going out to Bulgaria that week as well, so a lot going on. 
One of our favorite things to do, though, as a church is to, again, take a series, lock ourselves into it for the entire summer. And so that's going to be the fruit and the vine this year. We're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, but we're going to talk about the vine first. So yes, in reverse order, and yes, on purpose. Um, if, if you're like me as well as liking the summer and the things of the summer, um, how many of you enjoy the fruit that we get available to us in the summer? Like I like fruit year round, but I'm just going to make a case that summer fruit is the best fruit, right? In season. I mean, peaches, nectarines and plums, right? We got cherries. I'll get there, Ev. Hold on a second. <laughs> Looking at my notes. I knew it was you, didn't I? <laughs> Berries, I mean, we got all kinds of berries, right? Blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, right? Nobody ever uses the P in raspberry. Here's my homework for you this week. Next time you go to the store and you look for raspberries, don't ask them for raspberry, ask them for raspberry. Let's just not leave the P out. I mean, that poor P, right? He's just kind of there and ignored, right? Um, all kinds of berries, watermelon, we got honeydew, we got cantaloupe. I mean, great, but there's something about in the summer biting into a fresh, maybe even cold piece of fruit that's refreshing, it's juicy, it's sweet. There's just something that feels like summer. And what we're going to do over the next couple of months is talk about a different kind of fruit, a fruit that's even more nourishing than some of that fruit, maybe your favorite summer fruit or any other season. We're going to talk about some fruit that's produced in our lives by something other than ourselves, but we have an integral and important part to play in that. We're going to talk about fruit that won't be on any display in a grocery store or any roadside stand, and it didn't even come out of the soil in our great garden state. We're going to talk about the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in our life. So let's, let's talk about this in Galatians 5, and we're going to hear this verse every week, so I wanted to give it to us this week at the outset of the series, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Both this and the passage in John are going to be familiar to many of us, but hear it again today. But the Holy Spirit, Paul says, produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Let me pause there for a moment. You notice that it didn't say we produce that fruit. But we have a part to play, and we're going to talk about that through the next 10 weeks. But it's the Holy Spirit who produces this fruit in our lives. And here's the list. It's love, it's joy, it's peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How many do you agree with me? That, that's a good list, right? Turn to the person on the side of you and tell them that's a good list. Yeah. Turn to the other person, your second choice, and tell them you need to pay attention to that list. I mean, that is an incredible list, right? Nine elements of the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm emphasizing the word fruit, singular, because in the original language that Paul wrote it to us in, he doesn't use it plural. Many times we hear it or we'll say it or even teach it as the fruits, plural, of the Spirit, but it's singular. In other words, we're meant to have on display in our lives all nine parts of the fruit of the Spirit. That's a tall order, and I'm so grateful that it doesn't depend on me to produce that, because how many of you know, like, man, six out of nine is a pretty good day, right? Like, three out of nine is a good day. I mean, you're batting 333 at the plate. Like, I mean, just love, joy, and peace, like, that's a good day. But, but listen to the list again, and we're going to explore these in depth. We're going to take a week on each of them starting next Sunday, but love, joy, peace, patience. Patience is a tough one, right? You know that old adage, right? Don't pray for patience because the Lord will give you plenty of opportunity to put it into practice, right? I saw that in the list. I knew it was coming, so I asked Pastor Arlena to preach that week. <laughs> so there you, there you have it. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and everybody's favorite, self-control. Now, it's interesting. We'll talk about that at the very end of the series, of course, because it's the last one. But self-control seems like it depends solely on ourselves, but be mindful, this is the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives. Now, none of that happens, and it's the fruit and the vine series, without us being connected to the vine. And that's what we want to concentrate on today. Because if you're not connected to the vine, then none of the fruit that we mentioned there, no matter how great, no matter how refreshing it is, is even possible to us. So look at Jesus' words in John chapter 15. If you have a red letter Bible, these words will be in red. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. 
He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes or cuts back so that it will be even more fruitful. And there's a lot going on here, and there's repetitive language on purpose. So let's stay together. You're already clean, Jesus says, because of the word that I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up. They're thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. We won't spend a lot of time on that point today, but I don't want you to miss the fact that it is the father's will for you to be fruitful. God expects us to produce fruit in our lives. And Jesus is saying the only way that it's possible for us to sink our teeth into the life nourishing and life refreshing fruit of the spirit, the peace, the goodness, the faithfulness, the self-control, any of that fruit, the only way that's possible is if we're grafted into or remaining in the vine. Now, again, some of us have heard this passage many times before, and the tendency from our human nature is for us to just let it fall on deaf ears. We become sometimes to familiar passages immune to their power because we're just used to what we think we know from there. But I'm just praying today for my heart and for all of our hearts and for us as a, as a church, a local church, a community of faith together, that no matter how many times you've heard this idea out of John 15, that he's the vine and we're the branches, that it would fall on your ears and into your heart in a fresh and new way today, that you would recommit yourself to saying, Lord, I'm going to stay connected to you regardless of what's going on around me, regardless of what's taking place, even uh, very close to me and maybe even within my own home and my closest relationships, because your desire is, Lord, for me to produce fruit. Now, we'll get to this when we talk about the fruit of faithfulness, but for, for many Christians, The idea is to just simply be faithful, and God requires of that. That's the remaining part we're talking about today. But faithfulness and fruitfulness can never be separated, according to Jesus. Like God intends for us to bear fruit, and I love Jesus' words. He didn't say a little bit. He said, it's the Father's will that you would bear much fruit. Why? Because it's a representation of who Jesus is in your life and what he wants to do in the lives of others that we're close to. There's a bigger picture that he wants to come into focus. So let's go back to a couple of verses. In verses 4 and 5 from our text in John, Jesus says it this way. I want you to hear it again. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do, say it, nothing. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Now, the word that, that Jesus is using there, that the gospel writer John is recording down is this word meno, M-E-N-O in the Greek. And he uses it, Jesus does, 11 times in the first 10 verses. We just read up to verse 8. 10 of those 11 are directed towards us remaining in him. The 11th time is talking about the way that he remained in the Father as an example. So you don't have to be the brightest bulb in the case to realize that if Jesus talks about something 10 times in 10 verses, he's doing it for special emphasis. That he's wanting us to understand and get the full picture that in order to produce fruit in our lives, we absolutely need to remain in him. Now, this word meno uh, in the King James translates it. Some of you may have memorized it like this. It translates it as abide, right? To remain or to abide or to stay or to, I like the word continue. It means that it has a bunch of different uh, words that fit, all very similar. But the word continue gives us this picture that what you've already taken part of, that you progress in that. In other words, remain or abide or stay in me is to continue in Jesus. 
It's to continue your relationship with him. I love that we call our relationship, one of the ways that we refer to our relationship with Christ is it's a walk with Jesus, right? That there's progress. Listen, the Holy Spirit, is a, he's a God that moves. And so he's, if he lives inside of us, we should always be moving, right? We should be moving towards him. We should be moving out towards other people. He's a, he's a God that's on the move. So we continue in him is what Jesus is driving at. Why? Because remaining is required for reproduction. It's so important that we understand that Christ has called us to remain in him, to remain in him in order that we be uh, able to produce fruit. Because again, apart from him, we can do nothing. I'll say it to us like this. Detachment from the source is always always the beginning or the result of it is decay. Whenever we're detached from the source, decay sets in quickly. And decay is just a nice way of saying death, isn't it? Right? When we detach ourselves from the source, the moment the fruit is cut off of the branch, it no longer, right, has, has, has life in it, but it's not going to grow anymore, right? It may, depending on the fruit, take some time to ripen. Other fruits are as ripe as they'll ever be the moment you sever them from the branch, but the life source has been cut off. So every time we're detached from Jesus, the vine, death and decay begin to set in. So in order to look and love and live like Jesus, we have to remain connected to him. And here's our big thought, right? This would be a great place, hint, hint, to write down uh, this phrase because it's going to set the, uh, us into motion throughout this series. And that's this thought that remaining in the vine is required for producing fruit. There are a lot of people, Christians I'm talking about, that think that they can produce the fruit of the spirit by being close to the vine. Or by being near others that are connected to the vine, getting close to the branches. But it doesn't work that way. Jesus made it very clear in this passage. Oftentimes we think we can manufacture our own fruit. We think that we can manipulate others or situations and make it appear as though there's this authentic and life-giving fruit that's available. Uh, how many of you ever grew up in a home where there was the fruit in the house and then there was the bowl of the artificial fruit? Right? <laughs> I never quite understood that. I remember my grandparents, my grandmother having that. We had one um, in our home too. We had the one that was like, you know, there's styrofoam and then there's like a felt covering of the fruit, but then they sequined them all with these pins and you're like, we don't know. It was like bedazzled before there was bedazzling, right? And it's like, it's supposed to look shiny, but you know, you're not going to bite into it because it's not real fruit. Well, sometimes our lives, we manufacture our fruit in a way to make it look juicy and sweet and tasting to others, but they didn't come from the source. And it's sobering and a little scary to me, if I'm honest with you, of just how close you can be to Jesus and not be connected to him. So how's that even possible? Let me show you a passage. This is Jesus in the gospel of Matthew chapter seven, verses 21 through 23. I'm just going to warn you ahead of time. It's a sobering passage. And Jesus says these words in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father in heaven. He says this, many will say to me on that day, on the judgment day, Lord, Lord, we didn't, we didn't, we prophesy in your name and in your name, drive out demons and in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Ooh, hold on, Jesus. Are you having a bad morning? Like, what's going on here? Right? What Jesus was pointing out is there are many that, that did things in his name that didn't know him. They weren't close to him. They had no relationship with him. And there are a lot of things that we can do in the name of Jesus that might appear to be real fruit, but would be like taking a bite out of those artificial ones that sit on the counter or in the middle of the table. That's what Jesus is really driving at here. And it's, 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 I say it's scary and sobering because think about, think about even being here today in church. You took time out of your Sunday, whether it's online or in the room. Maybe you brought some people with you. Maybe you're here by yourself. Maybe you're invited and you're not even sure why you're here or why you said yes. Maybe you're here because you've been coming for years after years after years and that's what you do on Sunday. Right? We're here because we want to love and we want to honor Jesus, but you can be really close to the people of God and still miss God himself. To continue on a little bit with the 
illustration of the vine and the branches, you can be in the garden and still not be connected to the source. I think of the garden as community around other believers, people that love Jesus. I think about how we do it here at Kingsway. We, we just do it in life groups, and we ask people to gather and to care for one another. And we're in the summer now, which is not one of our normal semesters, but some groups are still meeting and hanging out. We had a joy last week of being with the majority of our life group together, one of the families in it hosted, and we we're just, just hanging out and fellowshipping together, catching up on life. And there's a, there's a joy there, but you can surround yourself with that and still not be in the vine. In fact, you can be in the vineyard. In the vineyard throughout scriptures is a place where, where, there's, where there's fruit being produced, of course, but where God's people are working. They're tilling the ground, right? So there's this vineyard, like an olive grove, right? Or there's grapes growing off the vine. And it, it's, it's always connected or synonymous with, with work and production. And you can be serving. Hey, you could serve at Serve Week and still not be in Jesus. That's what's sobering. Hey, you could be in the greenhouse and not be connected to Jesus. What's the greenhouse? I think the greenhouse for us is an atmosphere like this where we come and we worship together on a Sunday and we hear the word of God and we're going to celebrate communion in a little while together. You could be all around that and still not be connected to the vine. Jesus is saying it doesn't matter how many of those things you do, whether it's prophesying in his name or healing others in his name or whatever whatever you do in and of yourself, in your flesh. But the importance is on the relationship. He said to them, I never knew you. Scary and sobering words. Why? Because it's not about acts of love and joy and kindness and goodness. It's about an attitude of our heart that those things flow out of. And that can only happen when we're transformed by the power and the love of Jesus Christ. So you say, all right, great, Phil, I get that. That makes sense. But how do we remain in Jesus? That's the question for today. How do we remain in Jesus? We could build an extensive and comprehensive list, but I think there are three evident responsibilities, even with the verses we've looked at so far, three responsibilities that we have to assume. Okay, so here's, here, here's the bad news for you. I can't assume these for you. The person sitting next to you, no matter how much they love you, they can't assume them for you. You can't assume them for anyone else. These are three responsibilities that we have to assume to remain in Jesus. The first one is presence. Presence. You say, isn't that the part that Jesus does? It's his presence in our lives. It's his presence that fills the room when we gather today. Absolutely it is. But we have a responsibility to nurture and to cultivate a room in our hearts, in the soil of our hearts, so that his presence can be there. And we welcome that. The Bible tells us that wherever we worship him, wherever God's people praise him, there he dwells. When we come together corporately, but also personally, also individually. So how do we remain in him? Listen, I'm just going to give you some basics. And, and, I, and I think of this out of verse 3 of, of John 15 that we read already. It said, Jesus said that you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Now the word clean and prune that he uses in those first few verses, they mean the same thing. In other words, I'm refining you. I'm cleansing you. So you're already clean because of the word. Well, what's the word that he's spoken to them? It's the word of truth. It comes in two parts. It's Jesus, the living word of God that's standing right before them, delivering them these verses that we're reading. And it's the written word of God that we have today that details and gives us a story of not only in the gospels and the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament, but even the story of Israel and all throughout the Old Testament. So, so what am I saying to us today? The way that we need to stay connected to Jesus, this is foundational, it's basic, and it's not even all that exciting for those of us that may have been doing it for a long time, but you know that if you've put this to practice, you're where you are in your walk with Jesus because the word is a priority in your life. So this, this book is more than a book, right? And the, the purpose of the book is for us to not just know the book, it's for us to know the God of the book, right? The Bible details who God is to us, what Jesus has done for us, the character and nature that we ought to see on display in our lives, i.e. the fruit of the Spirit, right? So, so knowing God's word is one thing, studying it, and like King David talked about, meditating on it, thinking on it, and then listen, application. There are a lot of people, let me just say this to you, church, there are a lot of people that, that know this book, that have studied this book, that have written commentaries on this book, that have um, maybe even tried to, to teach others this book, but haven't lived or applied the book. 
It's not just a history book. There's history in here. It's the only book ever. These words are alive and active. It says in Hebrews, sharper than any two-edged sword. What's the power in God's word being alive is that it can be alive inside of us. It's alive in us. That's how we foster and nurture God's presence. One of the other ways we do that, this is basic, I understand, but we've got we've to remain or continue in this. It's prayer. It's your conversation with the Lord that's ongoing. The Bible tells us on more than one occasion to pray without ceasing. Be fervent in prayer. Be consistent in prayer. It's just an ongoing conversation with God. And then there's the time of worship. And not just what we did together today to sing a few songs together and hear God's word, but personal worship. Can I just encourage you as your pastor? Listen, if you don't have times regularly, daily of personal worship, listen, carve that out into your life. It might be putting a playlist on in the background. It might be, you know, playing back today's service or last week's service or another church's service, but, but, but fill your life with worship. If the only time you worship Jesus is on Sundays, yeah, you're going to be weak by about Monday afternoon, right? Like, like fill your life with that. Nurture his prayer. That's how you remain in him. That's how you continue in him. That's how you abide in Jesus, right? That's our first very clear and evident responsibility to assume. The second one is obedience, or I'm sorry, is dependence. So it's presence and it's dependence. Jesus said it in John 15, 5. You helped me say it a little while ago that apart from me, we can do nothing. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. We are, we are to recognize that everything not only comes from him, but everything is sustained by him. And I'll just, as real as I can be with you, the longer I walk with the Lord, the more I realize, Jesus, I need you. Oh my goodness, like just when I think I'm getting it together, <laughs> just when I think I have it figured out a little bit, just when I think I'm like, oh, I, I can put this Christianity thing in cruise control, man, the Holy Spirit will just bring me right back to that place. No, Lord, I'm fully reliant on you. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Totally dependent on him for strength, for energy, for wisdom, for understanding, I need him to be a husband. I need him to be a father. I need him to be a pastor. I need him to be a friend. I just need, I need him to get through my day, right? Like there are times where you're making, so, you know, this way we're making so many decisions left and right. You, if you're leading and caring for other people, now you're making decisions that affect them. And, and I don't know about you, but sometimes at the end of the day, you put your head on a pillow and you're like, I made it. Like I just got through the day. And Lord, before I get up tomorrow and my feet get out of this bed, like I'm already declaring for tomorrow, I need you again. Like I'm dependent on you. It's nurturing his presence, but it's also understanding that there's got to be a dependence on him, that apart from him, I could do nothing. And, and here's what I catch myself doing at times. See if this resonates with you. I like, I, like the, I like the hacks. I like the cheat codes. I like the shortcuts. Like, Lord, I want to produce goodness and gentleness and faithfulness, but is there a little cheat code I can put in for that? Is there some kind of coupon code that we can punch in? Like, is, is there some other way we can get there? And that's the thing about the fruit of the Spirit in our lives is it develops slowly over time, but it brings back a compound interest <laughs> that you can't manufacture on your own. So our dependence on him is vital for us to produce fruit that will point people back to Jesus. It's cultivating that presence. It's being fully dependent on him. And then third and final, and this is the hardest one, it's obedience. Nobody likes that word. This is usually the part of the message where everybody's checking out. They're like, let's do communion. Let's get Kona ice and we're out of here, right? We don't like hearing about obedience. I don't know that I like hearing about obedience, but there's something about obedience that is the key that makes everything else start. John, who wrote the Gospel of John, said in one of his later letters in 1 John 2, 5, that if anyone obeys his word, God's word, love for God is truly made complete in them. Do you get that? Listen, listen to those words. If anyone obeys God's word, his love is made truly complete in them. And this is how we know we are in him. When we're obedient, there's no cheap substitute. There's no shortcut to that. There's just obedience. I knew I wouldn't get a lot of amens during this part in the service, and that's okay. It's hard for me to say amen to it myself. But, but here's the thing. We grew up singing an old hymn. It goes, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus 
but to trust and obey. Anybody remember that hymn? Anybody remember that? A few people. I would sing it for you, but there's a frog that's been in my throat the last couple days, and you don't want me to do that. So, But listen, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy or fulfilled in Jesus but to trust and obey. And it, it really is that simple <laughs> and that challenging at the same time. But if we're obedient to him, that's how others will know. That's how we'll know. That's how the Father will know that we are remaining in him because truth discovered must be truth that's obeyed. It's one thing to discover the truth of God's word. It's another thing to obey it. It's challenging. It's hard at times. In fact, Paul in Galatians chapter 5, before we get to the fruit of the Spirit that we read and we're camping out in the next couple of months, about 15 verses before that in Galatians 5, 7, he, he's, he's doing some correcting of the churches in Galatia. And he says these words, you were running a good race, but who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? In other words, he's dealing with, with, with a group of people in a bunch of churches that, that are running well, and then all of a sudden they just let somebody cut in on their race, and they cease to obey what God had already shown them. And then 15 verses later, after a little more correction, he outlines to them, but the fruit of the Spirit looks like this, love, joy, peace, and so on. See, it's obedience and walking in obedience that allows that fruit to be produced in our lives. So what then does that look like before we get to communion? It, it's not about us. It's not about us thinking we're ever going to get it all perfect. That's why God's grace is so wonderful. It's why it's so amazing to us. But obedience is required. The Old Testament tells us that obedience is better than even sacrifice. And sacrifice is important. And it's required of us at times. But obedience is all the more better because as we cultivate God's presence in our lives and we learn to continually and daily depend on him, what Jesus is telling us that if you want to remain in me and be productive in the fruit that the Holy Spirit will produce through you is that you must obey the words that I've taught you. I love Psalm 1830. We don't have it on the screen. It says this, that as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. Love those words. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. It's perfect. So let me just, a little deductive logic here as we go to communion in a moment. Ready? If God's word is perfect and you're obedient to it, will you produce fruit? Let me ask it again. If God's word is perfect and you're obedient to it, will it produce fruit in your lives? Yes, every single time, because it always accomplishes what it goes out and intends for. And all we need to do with the help of his Holy Spirit is to be obedient to that. I want you to grab your um, communion elements there, your cracker and juice. I love the thought of this obedience and the challenge for us today is this. Let me ask it to you in question form. Will you commit to remain in his presence, to live in dependence, and to continue in obedience? That's the way we remain in him. And yes, it's challenging, but he didn't ask us to do it alone. He didn't ask us to do it in our own strength. That's what's incredible about our God. He gave us the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm going to go back to the Father, and the Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to give you the power to be my witnesses. He's going to convict you. He's going to lead you in all truth. He's going to be your comforter. He's going to be your counselor. The thing that's striking about us talking about obedience to remain in Jesus, I want you to get this picture, is that Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus was obedient to death, even death on a cross. So here's the wonderful thing about our God. Again, like he does all throughout the Gospels, Jesus models to us what he's requiring of us. He didn't ask of us something that he wasn't willing to do himself. He was, according to Paul in Philippians 2, not only obedient, but he was obedient even unto death and death on a cross, death in the ugliest and harshest of ways. 
And so as we come to the communion table together today and celebrate what he's done, Jesus said, hey, every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do it in remembrance of me. The way that we continue to remain in Jesus is by regularly remembering what he's done for us. We do that here about once a month or so, and it's a time for us not to just pause at the end of service and do something that they did in days gone by. It's something that Jesus himself instituted for us and said, hey, when you take this bread, remember it was broken. My body was broken for you. So as you hold on to that cracker, don't eat it just yet. We'll, we'll eat in just a moment. But the Bible tells us that after the last supper on the night Jesus was betrayed, his last meal with his disciples, plates are cleared out of the way. You can imagine somewhat of a clean table and he takes bread and he thanks the father for it. He blesses it and then he breaks it. And he says, this bread is symbolic of my body that's broken for you. It's the way that we remain or continue in Jesus is being mindful of the way that he modeled obedience to the Father for us. So Lord, we just say thanks for your body today. We remember your sacrifice for us. We remember that you've called us for the Father's glory to produce fruit. And the only way that that's even possible is as we're connected to you. So Lord Jesus, we thank you and we ask you for your strength as we eat this bread together. Let's take the bread together. You want to just peel back that foil layer, hold that juice a moment. We'll drink together in a second. The Bible says in like manner after the bread that Jesus took the cup and he told the disciples, he said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant was going to seal the deal. The blood, the blood was for forgiveness of sins. It was what they knew in the Old Testament that had to be from a perfect and spotless lamb that they would offer they would bring before the priest and sacrifice for their sins. And Jesus is telling them just hours before he goes to the cross, the juice we're drinking today or the wine they had at the Last Supper was a representation of his blood that was going to be spilled out for them. I'm going to pray over this in a moment and then we'll drink, but I'm just going to ask with heads bowed all across the room, for those of you joining us online, maybe today you find yourself far from Jesus. Your sins have separated you from him. Or maybe, maybe you've never made a confession of faith in Jesus as Lord. Not just the decision that he is who he says he is, but your willingness to surrender like we already sang about today. Before we drink this together, it's only right that I give you an opportunity, extend to you the invitation that the Father himself extends to us. That our sin that separated us from God was paid in full by Jesus on the cross. He died not just for us, but in our place. The payment of our sin was death, Romans tells us, but Jesus came and took it for us. And if you're far from Jesus today and you just say, Lord, would you forgive me of my sins? I want you to know that he's present today. He hears you. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer. I'm not going to, this is normally the part in the service. We'll, we'll ask people to raise their hand if they want us to pray for them to receive Jesus salvation. But just in your own words, you could say something just like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I'm far from you. Forgive me of my sins. I believe in what your son Jesus did on the cross for me. I believe that the juice that I hold in my hand is a representation, is a symbol of the blood that he shed for me so that my sins can be wiped out and I can be made brand new like the Bible tells. So Lord, as you're doing that now, I pray God that you would seal in hearts for those that are making a confession of faith right now, for those that are stepping into a brand new relationship. Your word tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we're saved. We have a new life. So Lord, as you're doing that right now, we say thank you for it and we celebrate this cup of freedom. You said that every time we drink it, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let's drink together. Amen. Amen. Man, doesn't it feel good to just celebrate what Jesus has done? Amen. Amen. Listen, let me, let me pray for you, and then I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dave, and we'll sing a response song here in just a moment. Father, we're so thankful for your body and your blood that were intended for us. Jesus, your willingness to give them both on our behalf. And now, Lord, we ask you as we make our way through this summer, as we make our way through this week, Lord, as we make our way through this Sunday, that you would help us to be mindful 
of the responsibility of your presence of dependence and of obedience to remain in you God so that we be connected to the vine because you're our source of life we thank you in Jesus name amen